I hope everybody had a nice mini break. Um, so we are, um, I guess about two thirds of the way through the semester. Um, so a new syllabus is up um, that starts with today and goes forward. We have the assignment. Um, for those I know some of you have done it um, from last week, uh, which is to listen to that recording and have a response paper. Um, so just get me that again, the deadline there is, I think it's like April 23rd, it's the last day of our, of our classes. So just shoot me that. Uh, when you've got it. And um, we're sort of onward and upward. Um, any questions about where we're going the rest of the course? Um, any procedural questions? Um, I will have a sample exam or sample exam questions that I'll post um, at some point and we'll spend uh, a class session going over those. So last week will be a review and a going over exam questions. Uh, and the exam, as you know, is the eight hour floating take home uh, through TWIN. Okay, so the lecture, the video lecture that I, uh, that I posted on reverse 704C allocations, it's an important concept. We're going to see it again. Um, actually, today we'll do a little bit of that stuff too. But um, the idea here is that when you have a partnership an existing partnership and a new partner is going to come in by contributing cash or property or services that the existing partners, the old partners are going to book up their capital accounts, uh, revalue their capital accounts. And what that means is that you're going to revalue all of the assets on the, uh, for book purposes. This is just a book revaluation. So Tax lawyers talk about book ups. It's just book. Now it can go down too. You can have book downs too. Um, but book. So for capital accounts, you will restate all of the assets book value to fair market value. Um, and then allocate the resulting book gain as the partners have agreed to share it. So the capital accounts, again, let's assume it's going up. The capital accounts will be booked up to fair market value for the existing partners. And then the new partner comes in through his or her contribution. And we now have created a book tax disparity uh, with respect to the assets that were uh, in the partnership before and with respect to the capital accounts. We now have book capital accounts that are different than tax capital accounts. Um, and it's another book tax disparity and 704C deals with that in the same way. And so one way to conceptualize the book up, it's like, it's like the old partners sort of contributing the property, the partnership property into a new partnership with the new partner. So if they did that, then it would just be you know, straight 704C. Um, but it's the same economic effect it's a, as if um, the new partner just contributes cash or property to the partnership. Um, and so once you get that idea that's reverse 704C allocation, then the only tricky part is that um, the contributors with respect to the booked up property are the old partners. Um, they're the ones who got the book credit for fair market value of the asset. And so they're the ones who are on the hook for the 704C liability. So, um, and we went with that, I went through that. So any questions on that? I know it's a lot of stuff. Um, you guys might not have watched that for a while, but uh, don't. Um, I don't wanna uh, suggest that that's not important. It's important stuff. We'll see it two more times at least. Okay, any questions? All right, hearing none. So today, we're uh, the next two classes, we're gonna go back to um, outside basis. So we've kept track, uh, we'll keep track of potentially three different accounts for the partners. We've got our book capital accounts, uh, which are um, where the rules are in the 704B regulations. We have our tax capital accounts, which are much like book capital accounts, but we use tax basis instead of fair market value. And we use that when we have 704C property, whether straight or reverse. And then we have outside basis, which we talked about earlier in the course, and we've kind of got away from because we're focused on these other things now. So now we come back to outside basis. Um, 
And uh, they're similar. These three accounts are similar in many ways, but of course they're different um, in important ways, potentially important ways. So just to get back into outside basis, let's start thinking about, well, why does it even matter? Why do we care about outside basis? What's the relevance of outside basis? And it may not be you know, immediately apparent why we care about outside basis, um, but it'll allow us to reflect back on some rules we've already covered. So let's turn to the code. Let's turn to section 704D, 704D of the code. So 704D right here, if you recall, 704 is the, is the rule that tells you how we allocate tax items among the partners. And we have all these rules about how, you know, you the partnership agreement will say how to allocate, and then we test it to see whether it'll be respected. Um, and then once it's respected, then the allocations flow through to that partner and they're reported on that partner's tax return. Well, here's an important exception to that rule that when there's a not enough outside basis to absorb a loss or deduction, that loss is suspended. So that's one reason we care about outside basis, because if we're gonna flow through losses, we need to have enough outside basis to absorb those losses that flow through. Otherwise, those losses will be suspended and carried forward to the next year where they'll be subject to the same limitation. So we need to know outside basis when we get allocated losses, net losses for the year. I mean, if we have net income for the year, if our income exceeds our losses, then we're not gonna have a problem because our outside basis goes up by the income and down by the losses, the net adjustment is gonna be positive. But if we end up with a net loss during the year, we need to know our outside basis at the end of the year before we flow through these losses. Because if we don't have enough outside basis, some or all those losses will be, will be suspended. Right, that's from early in the semester. We talk about 704D. Any questions on that? So we know outside basis can be relevant for flow through of losses under 704D. Let's turn now to section 731 of the code. Section 731. Another provision we've looked at before. We're gonna spend some more time soon, but this deals with distributions. And 704, 731A1 says, gain shall not be recognized to such partner, except to the extent that any money exceeds the adjusted basis of such partner's interest in the partnership. So if we get a distribution of cash, we need to know what the outside basis of the partner who receives the cash distribution is. If the, out, if the partner has sufficient outside basis to absorb the distribution, then the distribution of cash is tax-free. If on the other hand, the outside basis is insufficient to absorb the distribution of cash, then some or all of the cash distribution will result in gain. So those are two, that, that, so 731A1 and 704D are both rules that you want outside basis. You want outside basis so you can flow through losses now instead of getting them suspended. You want outside basis so that you avoid gain recognition. And it's timing, by the way, if you have the gain recognition now, you're gonna have less gain later. So it's all timing, but again, tax planning is timing. So outside basis is good we want it, and primarily for those reasons. There are some other reasons that come into play, but these are the most important ones. Okay, any questions on that? So if we don't have allocations of losses, net losses during the year, we don't have distributions of cash during the year, we may not really care very much what outside basis is, uh, but we still need to keep track of it. Okay, so that's why it's important. Again, 704D and 731A1. Any questions on that? Okay, and then, well, how do we, what is, how do we calculate outside basis? So a little bit of review here. We can start out with section 722. Let's turn there, 722 of the code. And 
And this is for someone that contributes cash or property to a partnership in exchange for the partnership interest. And it tells you that your outside basis is the amount of money in the adjusted basis of property contributed. It's a carryover basis. Whatever your basis is and the stuff you contributed, that becomes your initial outside basis of your uh, in your partnership interest. So that's our starting basis. Now we could acquire, this is if we acquire a partnership interest directly from the partnership by contributing cash or property to the partnership. We could also buy a partnership interest, an existing partnership interest from another partner. So we'll deal with that next week. Um, but for now, we'll just focus on direct issuances of partnership interest. Okay, and then what happens to that outside basis as we as the partnership operates. Well, let's turn to section 705 of the code. 705. And this tells us about our adjustments to outside basis. And it starts with 722. 742 deals with what I just referred to if we buy a partnership interest, an existing partnership interest. And then it, we increase it by your allocations of income so it goes up, floats up with your allocations of income. Makes sense. Uh, you get allocated income, you're taxed on that income, you get more basis. You decrease your outside basis by distributions and by your allocations of losses. So those are your general rules. Outside basis goes up when you get allocated income, your outside basis goes down when you get allocated losses and deduction, it's all, uh, and when you get when you receive distributions of cash or property, and we can kind of see with this, it says not, not below zero, why we have 704D and 731A1, because we can't let your outside basis go below zero. So we basically stopped the allocation of losses when it would take you below zero, and we impose gain when you have distributions that would take you below zero if the distributions were tax-free. So that's, that's the rule. Again, this is all review. I mean, it's nice to come back to this stuff. We've seen 705 uh, a lot. And um, that's our adjustments to outside basis. Uh, let's turn to section 733 really quickly. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on 733 right now. We'll come back to it later. But it tells us how to reduce our outside basis for distributions. And we reduce it by the amount of money distributed. So cash goes down, your basis goes down dollar for dollar. And if you receive property instead of cash, then your basis in your, your outside basis goes down by the basis you get in the property that you get distributed. And we'll talk more about that later on. We haven't focused on 733.2 at all. So that's new, we're not gonna focus on it now. Okay, so those are the outside basis rules. And then we have 752, our good friend 752. We spent some time on 752 before, let's turn there. And 752A says, it, any increase in a partner's share of the liabilities of a partnership or any increase in a partner's individual liabilities by reason of assumption by such partner or partnership liabilities shall be considered a distribution, a, a contribution, sorry, a contribution of money. It's a deemed contribution or constructive contribution of money by the partner to the partnership for tax purposes. Again, I've suggested you might wanna annotate your code and make clear that this, we're just talking about tax, not book. These are tax rules, 752. Book rules are in the regs under 704B. These are tax rules. So it's a deemed contribution of money. And what does that mean? Well, it means your outside basis goes up. Because when you contribute money, your outside basis goes up. So your outside basis goes up by when your share of the partnership liabilities goes up. 
or when you assume a partnership liability. So let's focus on this first. How do your, your share of partnership liabilities go up? Well, one way is the partnership could have new liabilities. Just borrow some partnership, borrow some money. Then your share of that may go up. Even if the partnership doesn't borrow new liabilities, your share could go up, it could be shifted. You could get more of the liability as we'll see from these rules through various um, mechanisms. But you're basically vicariously sort of getting a share of the liability. It's not your liability. Under state law, it's not yours. It's the partnership's liability, but you're treated as getting some. And when your share of that goes up, it's a deemed contribution of money by you. So your outside basis goes up. The second clause is referring to where your individual liabilities go up. You are assuming the partnership debt. You're saying that's my debt, not your debt anymore. That's more rare to happen, but it can happen. And it's, it's effectively a contribution of money. You're saying, okay, partnership, you know, that's not only your problem, it's my problem. Um, and that'll also be treated as a contribution of money by the partnership. Again, that's more rare. So we're really focused more so on this first clause here. Okay, and then the flip side is 72B says, that, on the other hand, if your share goes down or if the partnership assumes your individual liability, then that's a distribution of money, a deemed distribution of money, a constructive distribution of money to you by the partnership. And what do distributions of money do for you, do to you? Well, they reduce your outside basis. And then if you have insufficient outside basis to absorb the entire distribution, the excess is gain under 731A1. So these rules mean we have to keep track of when our shares of partnership liabilities go up or when they go down is really significant. We have to keep track of that stuff because that's gonna tell us what our outside basis is at the end of the year or at any time we have a distribution of cash to know whether we have gain. Any questions on these general rules? Again, this is, I, I don't think any of this is new. We've talked about this in the past. We, we did a sort of a, a foreshadowing of this. We, we talked about 752 early in the class. Um, now we're coming back to it in a more serious way. But so far we haven't sort of added anything to the mix. Okay, so now we will add to the mix because now the question is, well, how do you determine your share of the partnership liabilities? You know, some people will talk about it as an allocation and like you're allocating the liability. I'm gonna to try to re refer to the word as apportionment um, because allocation, we use that when we refer to tax items, income, gain, loss, deduction, you allocate those tax items. We're gonna talk about apportioning the debt and that's basically determining what's your share of the partnership debt. Does, and has it gone up or has it gone down? So we're gonna keep track of partner share, partnership debt. And we didn't talk about the rules in any depth. And so now we will. And the rules are not found in the code. We see this code section is pretty sparse. So the regs are where all the action is at on that issue. So let's turn to reg 1.752-2, 1.752-2. The dash one reg has some definitions and stuff. We'll, we'll refer back to it. But we really start with dash two. And what we're going to see is basically whenever you have a partnership liability, um, we're going to see to what extent any partner bears the economic risk of loss with respect to that liability. E-R-O-L, economic risk of loss. And to the extent any partner bears the economic risk of loss, that liability is known as a recourse liability under these rules. And that partner gets allocated that share of the recourse liability under dash two, under these rules we're gonna to cover today. We're gonna to cover dash three on Wednesday. 
dash three says, okay, some of those liabilities, no partner may bear the economic risk of loss. And the extent no partner bears the economic risk of loss, that's considered a non-recourse liability. And that's apportioned under dash three, 752 dash three. And there are a bunch of sort of rules tell you how to deal with non-recourse liability. Okay, so we start with economic risk of loss and how do we determine the uh, economic risk of loss? And we go to uh, B and it tells us a partner bears economic risk of loss for liability extent that if the partnership constructively liquidated, the partner would be obligated to make a payment to any person because that liability becomes due and payable and the partner would not be entitled to reimbursement from anybody else. So we're going to basically ask hypothetical, hypothetical question. If this partnership hypothetically liquidated, who would be left holding the bag? And this is going to be basically, we're going to see like everybody sues everybody under any sort of theory. And we're going to see who's left ultimately having to pay the creditor. And with respect to this constructive liquidation, what happens? Well, we're going to assume the debts, liabilities all become payable in full. So the mature, whatever the maturity date of the debt is, it's now. It's, this is the, you know, atom bomb scenario. You know, everything is a disaster, right? Worst case scenario. All your debts are due and payable. Everything is worthless, generally, even cash. like Venezuela, right? Cash is worthless. And now there's an exception with the exception of property contributed to secure a partnership liability. Everything's worthless. That's going to be not a, an exception. We're going to see. So everything's sort of worthless and the partnership disposes of everything for zero. So you're selling stuff for zero. And then we have this rule here, except relief for liabilities for which the creditor's right to repayment is limited solely to one or more assets. That's the Tufts rule. It's okay, you're gonna sell it for zero, but if you if you have a, uh, uh, an asset that secures a non-recourse liability, where the creditor is not entitled to any um, recourse, then you're gonna be deemed to sell it for the amount of the liability, just like you would with Tufts. Where the, in a non-recourse liability setting, your amount realized includes the amount of non-recourse debt. We'll see how that works out more on Wednesday. So for now, we can kind of set that aside. We're selling stuff for zero. And we're going to allocate all the resulting losses and deductions to the partners. Now, you might say, how do you have gain? Well, Tufts, you could have gain via Tufts. But without Tufts, Without the, this parenthetical, it's just going to be losses. You're selling stuff for zero. You're going to have losses absent, absent the Tufts rule. And the partnership liquidates. And then everybody sues everybody. Creditors sue the partnership, sues the partners, the partners sue each other. And who ultimately is left holding the bag? Who has to cut the check to the creditor? And to the extent a partner has to cut that check to the creditor, that partner bears the economic risk of loss. And that portion of the debt is a portion to that partner. Okay. Any questions on that? Well, let's run this through a uh, through a problem. So we've got, um, this is on page 221. We've got a pretty simple fact pattern here. You've got A, B, and C are each contributing cash to a partnership, general partnership. They are satisfying the primary test. So that's the big three. So they, maintain capital accounts, they 
liquidate according to positive capital account balances and partners have to restore negative capital account balances upon liquidation. And they're gonna allocate profits and losses 40% to A, 40% to B and 20% to C. Partnership takes the 60,000 of cash, borrows another 40 on a recourse basis and buys land for 100,000. So we're asking now, we have a $40,000 liability that's new. So the partner's share in the aggregate is gonna go from zero to 40, right? Their shares are gonna go up from zero to 40. The partnership didn't have no borrowings before. Now after it has 40, so that 40 is gonna go somewhere and it's gonna increase A, B, C's outside basis to some extent. And we have to know who. So we start to put this up in the, in the balance sheet. So we've got A, B, and C. And so we need to know what the outside basis is. So another way to say it is, well, what's the outside basis of each partner after these transactions. Um, and so we have to go through this hypothetical liquidation. And so we can just put up a simple balance sheet, just, just put the books up. We don't have to do deal with tax now. So we have the 40 of debt, that's recourse. And they've each contributed 20. These are our capital accounts. We've got the land. This the land has a book value of 100. Okay. So this is a book balance sheet. And now we go through this hypothetical liquidation and we say, okay, well, land is worthless. And we sell it for zero. So we have 100 of loss. How is a loss allocated? Well, it goes 40% to A, 40% to B, 20% to C. And then the partnership liquidates. So A's capital account is negative 20, B's capital account is negative 20, and C's capital account is zero. A and B and C have to restore negative capital account balances on liquidation. So A and B are gonna to have to kick in 20 each and that 20 each is gonna to go to the creditor. So who bears the economic risk of loss? A bears it to the extent of 20 and B bears it to the extent of 20. So this was all hypothetical. So now we can actually create the balance sheet with capital accounts and outside basis. Since we know now how it gets shared, we can add the outside basis. We don't have to put tax capital accounts up here because they're the same as the book. We don't have any 704C issue. So there's no need to create a third line here. So again, we start out with the cash contributions. Capital account goes up, outside basis goes up by the cash contribution. They buy the land, borrow the money, buy the land. They got a book value of the land of 100 and an inside basis of 100. And then under 752A, Seven twenty-two is a rule that causes the outside basis to go up there. Under seven twenty-two A and seven twenty-two, A is deemed to contribute twenty because his share of the partnership debt went up from zero to twenty, and B's share of the uh, partnership debt went from zero to twenty, so he's deemed to contribute twenty. And so after these transactions. 
A and B have a capital count of 20 and 40, uh, 20 and 20, sorry. Well, they all have a capital count of 20. A is an outside basis of 40, B is an outside basis of 40, and C is an outside basis of 20. And that's what our books look like immediately after basically the purchase of the land by the partnership with the borrowed money. I'll take questions in a second, but let's just check some things. So one thing you wanna check is that your books balance. So look at, we got our hundred of book value. That equals, that's the left side. The right side is 40 of debt and 60 of capital accounts. Our books balance and they have to balance. Your books, your book books have to balance, right? Tax, our inside basis is 100 and our outside basis is 100 as well. And again, we talked about this before, but that usually is the case, but not always. So if your book books don't balance, then you've done something wrong. Absolutely. There's something amiss. If your tax books don't balance, your inside base and outside bases don't balance, that doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. Uh, we'll see how that comes into play. But it's nice to check it. And you know, maybe if they don't balance, you might want to make sure why. But here they do. Let me just say one other thing, a common error the students will make, and I'll put it in red to illustrate it's, a, it's an error would be, I said, okay, A share went up by 20, that's a deemed contribution of money, so their capital accounts go up by 20. All right, that's, this is not doing it strictly for tax purposes, now you're doing it for book purposes. That's wrong, and one way that we know it's wrong is because that would mean that our capital accounts for A and B are 40 and 40. And now when we check and we say, okay, do our books balance? We would say, oh, we got a hundred on the left side. Now we'd have 40, 80, 120, 140 on the right side. That's not right. So when you have your increase in your share of partnership debt, it increases your outside basis, but it doesn't increase your capital accounts. If you did it that way, you're double counting the debt because you're already counting it here. And so you then be counting it there. That's double counting that creates that problem that we just, so don't do that. That's where again, under 72A and B, you can write at the end for tax purposes, making clear that it doesn't increase your book capital accounts, your, 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 ta your capital accounts, period. Okay, so any questions on, that's 1A. So all that work, all that hypothetical work of hypothetical liquidation, allocating the losses, seeing who, who has to pay, that was all done to figure out this. Right. And once we did that, that, that allowed us to figure out what each partner's outside basis was. All right. Questions? Anything? Thoughts? Okay. Let's um, go to B. So in B, they're just changing the amount of cash that each partner is contributing. But they're still going to share it share the everything 40, 40, 20. So again, just putting the, oh, I, I wanted to, let me go back to, this is just outside basis here. Just back to the other fact pattern. So A's outside basis was 40, B's outside basis was 40, and C's outside basis was 20. That's what we determined. And so if you want to ask, well, why? Why this economic risk of loss? What's going on here? It's actually a very taxpayer-friendly rule. 
and you're giving outside basis to the partners that could use it. And you're saying for A and B and C, what's the worst case scenario? How much losses could you possibly be allocated? And the answer is A is gonna be allocated at most 40, because he, he gets allocated 40% and the greatest loss possible is 100. So you're giving A enough outside basis so he could take all of his losses currently. Same with B and C, C doesn't need any more outside basis other than the 20 of the cash he contributed because his loss, maximum loss is capped at 20. There's only a hundred of land. The worst case scenario is that that hundred becomes zero, in which case C would get allocated 20 of losses. So it's actually a very taxpayer friendly, sort of a user friendly rule by giving it to the partner who can, needs it the most to absorb possible losses. So that's the theory here. Okay, so let's go back to now, we're back to part B, problem one B, and just putting the capital accounts up just to do the hypothetical risk of loss. A contributes 10, B contributes 20, C contributes 30. So it's still 60 total. They're still borrowing 40 on a recourse basis. They're still buying the land for 100. It's the book value. So again, hypothesize land is worthless, sold for zero, result in 100 of book loss. Allocate the book loss. Well, it's gonna go 40% to A under the agreement, 40% to B, 20% to C. That's our hypothetical loss. And then A's capital gain is gonna be negative 30. B's capital gain is not gonna be negative 20. C's copy is gonna be positive 10. And then if we liquidate, what's gonna to have to happen is A is gonna to have to kick in 30 because he has to restore deficits. All partners here under these fact patterns have to restore deficits on liquidation because the big three is, is satisfied. B has to kick in 20, that's 50 of cash. 40 goes to the creditor, 10 goes to C. So, the issue here is that A and B are gonna to have to kick in 50, but only 40 goes to the creditor. And the economic risk of loss is focusing on how much people have to pay to go to the creditor, not other partners. So because money is fungible, doesn't, you know, it's not like A's dollars are gonna to go to C and B's dollars are gonna to go to C and it all goes into a pot and all comes out, every dollar is the same. And so what you would do here would be since a and B have to kick in 50 and only 40 goes to the creditor. Basically 80% of every dollar that they kick in goes to the creditor and 20% goes to C. So what that means is of the 30 that A kicks in, 24 goes to the bank, 80%, six goes to C. And for B, 80% of his 20 days kick in goes to the bank and 20% four goes to C. So what's the economic risk of loss? It's this, A kicks in 24 and B kicks in 16. So A's share of the debt is 24 and B's share of the debt is 16. So what's A's outside basis gonna be? It's gonna be the 10 of cash contributed, actual cash contributed, plus the 24 of deemed cash contributed. So A's outside basis will be 34. B's outside basis can be the 20 of actual cash contributed, plus the 16 of deemed cash contributed. So his outside basis is gonna be 36. 
See the outside basis is just the 30 of actual cash contributed. He's not deemed to contribute any cash because he gets no share of the debt. Okay, so this problem is not all that significant. It just goes to show you that yeah, you look to see who has to kick in money and it's really focusing on the money that goes to the creditor. We don't care about the money that goes to C. Um, we care about who has to write checks to the creditor effectively. Any questions on B? Okay, in C, so now we're gonna make A and B limited partners. And they don't they don't have to restore their capital account deficits. And they're using the QIO, so they're gonna use the alternate effect test for A and B. C is a general partner. So what happens here? We're back to the original fact pattern here. Where they each contributed 20 of cash. And A is an LP, B is an LP. C is the GP. So again, we would uh, assume the land is sold for zero, allocate the resulting hundred of loss. And here it just says 40, 40, 20. And so under the agreement, that loss would be allocated per the agreement, again, 40, 40, 20. And that would appear to give A a negative capital account balance, B a negative capital account balance, C zero. Now we're again, so this loss is gonna get reallocated. It's not gonna actually work this way as we know because A and B can't go below zero for tax, you know, to, and that's really to see where the allocations and deductions and loss go. But let's just indulge this fiction here that A and B do have a negative capital account balance. And again, at this point, everyone sues everybody. So C might sue A and B and say, A and B, you got 20 negative capital account, you got to kick in 20. The creditor is going to sue the partnership, it's going to sue C as a general partner. And who's going to win here is um, A and B aren't going to have to kick in anything, right? Because they're going to say, number one, I don't have to restore negative capital account balances, that's in the agreement, right? That's gonna be a, a provision in the agreement, number one. And then they're also gonna say, well, as limited partners in a limited partnership under state law, we're not liable for the partnership debts. So we walk away free and clear. A and B are in the clear. They don't have to kick in anything. C on the other hand is vicariously liable as a general partner under state law, if the partnership doesn't have enough assets to pay the debt, and it doesn't, it's got nothing, the, then C is gonna have to write the check to the creditor. And so under these facts, all 40 of the debt goes to C, because C bears the economic risk of losses with respect to all 40. So just to put to complete the, the, the books, what's gonna happen here and their capital accounts are all 20. Just put the cash. This is the cash contribution. And then under 72A, 722A, C share goes up from zero to 40. 
because C bears the entire economic risk of loss. So the books are going to look like this. C gets all the debt. So that's the answer in C. And that hypothetical liquidation constructively goes all done to get this answer. A and B get no share of that debt. That's our answer. Any questions on the answer to C? And again, this is actually um, taxpayer friendly because we know that A and B, go back to 704B, you know, alternate economic effect test stuff, that A and B as limited partners that have no LDRO, and will have no general deficit restoration or limited, we know that the most losses they can be allocated is 20, their capital count. Their capital count can't go below zero. So ultimately, whatever the partnership agreement says, they will not be allowed to get losses below uh, more than 20. So they don't need outside bases more than 20, at least for loss absorption purposes. Ultimately, that loss, if it did happen where the land was sold for zero, that loss ultimately A would get 20, B would get 20, and C would get 60, right? That 40 of losses that are supposed to go to A and B would end up being reallocated to C because A and B can't go below zero. So we're giving outside basis to C and C is the one who's gonna need it the extra outside basis. A and B doesn't need, don't need it because they won't get allocated losses, ultimately more than 20 each. Okay, questions on, on C? Go to D. So I want to. I don't want to deal with this. Uh, if A contributes stock as security, but let's do. Let's just deal with the second part. So now, same as C, but now A. Contrib uh, a uh, contributes his, a promissory note. So A also signs a promissory note in favor of the partnership. Um. And you may remember that when you contribute a promissory note, your own promissory note to the partnership, that that will support, that's a limited deficit restoration obligation, LDRO, that will allow the partner to go negative to the extent of that note. So if we go back here, This note doesn't go on the balance sheet. It's just treated as a deem as a deferred capital contribution. So again, we have A contributes 20, B contributes 20, C contributes 20, A and B are LPs, C is a GP. You've got 40 recourse. I've got the land. So again, we're going to assume the land is sold for zero. The losses would be allocated. The hundred of loss would presumably, well, not presumably, but per the agreement, be allocated this way. That would appear that A has got a negative capital account, B's got a negative capital account, C's got zero. And everybody sues everybody. Well, now C is going to say, okay, A, you have this promissory note that you have to satisfy. And the terms of the promissory note will say, I'm going to pay the promissory note on a certain date, but no later than 
liquidation of my interest. Right? You're not going to be able to get out before you pay the note. And so A is going to have to kick in $15,000. That's the amount of his note. And that $15,000 is going to be used to pay 15000 of the debt. So now there's only 25,000 left. And that would also take A's capital account back up to negative five. So now we're there. Now we've got 25 of the debt left. Again, if C argues A, hey, A and B, your capital accounts total negative 25, so you guys kick it in, they're gonna say, well, we don't have to restore capital accounts, so um, bug off, and C is going to be left holding the bag for the rest as the GP. So this, under these facts, A's share of the debt is 15, because he's got to kick in the 15 for his note. C's share of the debt is remaining 25 as a general partner of the partnership. So A's share is 15, C share is 25. So A's outside basis is gonna be the 20 of cash, actual cash, plus the 15 of deemed cash, 35. B's outside basis is just his actual cash of 20. C's outside basis is gonna be the 20 of actual cash and 25 of deemed cash, 45. And again, that works out pretty well if you tie this together with the alternate effect test, because A will end up being able to go down to negative 15. So he'll be able to claim 15 of those losses. So it gives him enough outside basis to take that extra 15. So again, it matches up. These match up very well with the stuff we've learned before. A's maximum loss that he can get allocated is going to be 35. 20, his capital account, 4, plus the 15, that he can go negative. B can only get allocated 20. He's just put in the 20 of cash, and he has no LDRO, no promissory note, no nothing. C as a general partner is going to be on the hook for everything that A and B don't pay. Any questions? All right, just to uh, show you where this is in the regs, let's go back to the regs for a second. So here it says, um, in, uh, this is dash two B3, the determination extent to which a partner is, has an obligation to make a payment is based on the facts and circumstances. Um, all statutory, this is like everybody sues everybody under any theory, all statutory and contractual obligations of partnership liability are taken into account, including contractual obligations outside the partnership, such as guarantees or indemnities, obligations to the partners that are imposed by the partnership agreement, including the obligation to make a capital contribution. So if you have an obligation to make a capital contribution, that's going to be taken into account and restore a deficit capital account. Um, and then this language here, taking into account this cross-reference here is referring to LDROs. So remember back that promissory notes of a partner is a deemed LDRO. That's what allow, that's what picks this up. That's what allows A's capital account to go to negative 15. It's also what means that A is deemed to have to kick in 15 to pay off the debt, the creditor. Okay, not hearing any questions, anybody, any thoughts? All right, uh, well, let's go to, uh, e. okay, so this gets a little bit confusing here. So now it's the same facts except A is going to guarantee the debt. 
So, and back here. So, at this point, So A is still a limited partner, as is B and C, and it looks like this. And again, the negative capital account, that's not gonna really have any impact here. A has no obligation to restore. The guarantee, you might think, okay, since A is guaranteeing the debt, A would have to kick in the 40, we have to pay the 40. The problem is, is that normally under the normal rules of guarantee, and this is state law, stuff, but normally when you're a guarantor of a debt and you are called to pay the guarantee, your rights are what they call subordinated to the rights of the lender. You step into the shoes of the lender, you're, caused, you're called to pay, but now you can then sue the borrower and say, hey, I was required to pay on this guarantee, so now you owe me the money. In other words, the guarantee is designed to protect the lender. Um, not the primary obligor. So if you think about this, if you buy a car and your parents guarantee the car loan, if your parents are called to pay the car loan, they can then collect the, the loan from you. They step, they become the lender. And the idea is that the guarantee is not designed to protect you as the borrower, but designed to protect the lender. And so ultimately, if that's the rule, if A's rights as a guarantor are subrogated to the rights of the lender, then even if A is called to pay, the guarantor, the, the borrower is gonna, I'm sorry, the lender is gonna probably go to the deepest pockets, right? So they'll sue your parents, not you. Um, and so they'll collect from the parents. Um, but even if that were to happen, because the A who's in the parents shoes here could then sue C and say, hey, um, partnership owes me the 40 that I was called to pay and see you as a general partner of a partnership are liable, I can then collect reimbursement from C. So ultimately, if everybody sues everybody, who's going to be left holding the bag, it's going to be C as a general partner of the partnership who's the borrower, even though A may be called to pay on the guarantee, A is going to have um, rights of uh, subrogation. Um, and that's shown just if you go uh, go to the regs 1.72-2F, 1.72-2F. We've got some good problems, here, examples here. So um, um, example one and two and three, are all good. So you should take a look at those on your own time. Those are all cover what we've talked about. But four is this example dealing with this problem where G is a limited partner, guarantees a portion of the partnership liability. <clears throat> and it says that under state law, G is subrogated the rights of the lender, G would have the right to recover from the general partner. Therefore, G does not bear the economic risk of loss. So this is right on point and would say that under these facts, C as a general partner continues to bear the economic risk of loss for the entire liability. So there's no change in E from C. Any questions on that? Well, G could, um, your G or, or A here could, in addition to a guarantee, A could indemnify C. So, or in lieu of a guarantee, A could indemnify C and A could basically say to C, say, to the extent you're called to pay on this loan, I will reimburse you. It could be a guarantee and an indemnity, or it could just be an indemnity. Um, and in that case, then A would, the economic risk of loss would then shift from C to A because the indemnity would be the last, um, the last uh, shift, right? That even if C were called to pay, then A would have to reimburse C. 
And so A would ultimately not fall in the bag. So it depends precisely as to what the contractual arrangement is between A and C, if any. And again, it's a question of state law. You can imagine in some cases, it may be not entirely clear what state law requires. It, sometimes people don't use the most precise language and the tax law is gonna depend on what you know, the IRS or the judge thinks state law would do. But again, it asks the hypothetical question, you know, everybody sort of sues everybody under any sort of theory and who wins? Somebody's got to win ultimately. Okay. Questions on one? Okay. Um, so problem two, we do next class. So we, I divided this between recourse and non-recourse liability. So problem two is a big non-recourse liability. Problem three, A, deals with uh, recourse liability as well. And so this allows us a revaluation um, review. And so let's put this on the board. This problem we've got a, starts out simply. And again, I'm just gonna put the books up. Well, no, I'm gonna I'll put it all up. So we've got A and B. So here I'll put all of it up. So we got our book capital account, our tax capital account, and our outside basis. And they each put in 150 of cash. Uh, the problem doesn't explicitly say this, but it's implied. If I were to test you on something like this, I'd be more explicit about what how it started. So they each put in 150 of cash. And they buy land number one for 300. The land goes up in value, sort of rises in value, but because the land, just because it goes up in value, there's been no realization event. So there's no tax consequence, so there's a realization event. And there's no book consequence either until either there's a realization event or a book up, a revaluation event, which there hasn't been yet, but there will be. Because now C comes in and says, you know what? Um, the land now is worth 800, let me put in 400 of value, and I'll get a one third interest going forward. And that makes sense. It's 800 of value, I put in 400. I put in 400 of 1200 of value, I get a one third interest. So when C does that, or we used to do that, in a, the partnership's gonna typically book up the value to fair market value. So we have a book up. So we're gonna increase the book value from 300 to 800 booking it up to fair market value. Don't increase the basis, there's been no tax consequence. So just book. So with a book up, we're gonna increase, uh, it's 500 of gain, and A and B have agreed to share the gains 50-50. So their book capital accounts go up by 250 each. There's no effect on the tax capital account. There's been no tax consequence, no effect on outside basis. There's been no tax consequence. So now after the book up, then we can now admit C. And C is contributing land number two And it has a fair market value of 700 and a basis, inside basis of 150, carry over from C. So this is C's contribution. 
Okay, so what sees capital account? Uh, well, we also have debt here. So that, that land number two is subject to a recourse liability of 300. So we got a lot going on here. So C is contributing land of 700 subject to a debt of 300, which the partnership assumes. So the partnership is assuming C's liability. So what about C's book capital count? Well, book capital count is gonna be the fair market value of the property you contribute, net of liabilities assumed by the partnership. So C's book capital count is gonna be 400. And that makes sense. That's the economic value that C has contributed. It's the equity in land number two. Okay, and that's net. Let me just show you where that comes from. This is back in our capital account maintenance rules. 1.704-1B2, four little i's, B, basic rules. Goes up by the fair market value of property contributed, net of liabilities the partnership is considered to assume. So there you go. That's what goes from 700, which is a fair market value, reduce it by 300, the liabilities the partnership is assuming. What about tax capital account? Well, tax capital account is the same as book, but instead of starting with the fair market value of the property, the book value, we're going to start with the adjusted basis of the property, the tax value, if you will, and again, reduce it by the partnership, by the liability assumed by the partnership. So it's going to be 150 less 300. So we have a tax capital account of negative 150. That's kind of new. We haven't done that before. But it's straightforward because just book cap accounts and tax, they just differ because of whether you're using the book value or the fair market value or the basis. And remember, book tax capital account is designed to keep track of this 550 book tax disparity and to make that clear. So that remains clear that we have that book tax disparity of 550. And then outside basis, at least under section 722, it's gonna start out by just the carryover basis. 722, there's that. Okay, so that's to start out, but we just haven't yet dealt with the debt. And this is that we haven't dealt with the debt yet. And so we've got, we've done this before. Uh, I'm gonna refer you back. Um, those using the regular partnership tax book, there's a problem on page 55 and page 71 of the combined book was this problem we did that was similar to this. And so go back and take a look at that. This, we haven't, this is not the first time we've done this, but we've got uh, C is shedding personal li uh, individual liabilities. So she, C is shedding individual liabilities. That's a constructive distribution of 300, those are coming off his books on 752B and section 733, that reduces C's outside basis by 300. So C's individual liabilities are going down by 300. They're coming off his books, going on the partnership books. But the other thing that's happening is now each partner's share of the liability is gonna go up because the partnership now is 300 of debt it didn't have before. So now we have to apportion this liability and say, okay, how is this liability shared? And so what we do at this point is we say, assume these assets are sold for zero. So we'd have an 800 loss on land one and a 700 loss on land two. 
something we haven't said explicitly yet, but this economic risk of loss, it's a financial, it's an economic concept, not a tax concept. So you use book. If book and tax differ, this is all book. Um, so we have a $1,500 loss when we sell land one and land two for zero. We allocate that $1,500 loss. It's a one third, one third, one third. So we allocated 500 to each A, B, and C, and it would take their capital accounts each to negative 100. And under these facts, it's not explicitly clear, but if they have to restore their capital account balances, then they each have to kick in 100. And so under those facts, they'd each have to kick in 100. So under 72A and 722, their outside basis would each go up by 100. And so for A and B, it's pretty straightforward. We end up with 400. 150 and 250, 400, 150, 250. For C, capital account is 400 book, tax is negative 150. Now here, it gets a little bit funky. Um, one thing we can say is that when you have these things like that go on simultaneously, it goes up and down. There's a rule, I'm not going to have time to look at it today, but we've looked at it before, 1.752-1F, that says when you have these things that happen at the same time, shedding individual liabilities and getting an increase in partnership share liabilities, that those are the net, you just net them together. So we have a constructive distribution of 200, not down 300, up 100, we have a constructive distribution of 200. So we start with an outside basis of 150, where C is deemed to receive money of 200. So C is gonna have 50 of gain. Under 731A1. And C's outside basis is gonna go from 150 down to zero. And we have reverse 704C property here. That's A and B are the deemed contributors of that. We've got regular 704C property here, and that's C's. And that's the answer. Again, the big thing here, we got 50 of gain for C. That's kind of counterintuitive, but it's the effect of the fact that he got shed, shed all this individual liabilities, only got back the 100. Uh, we talked in, in this problem, the one we did, la, uh, you know, again, page 55 of the regular book, 71 of the combined book, we talked about this, the same thing. C, how could C protect himself? Well, C could guarantee indemnify A and B and keep 50 of the 50 more of the debt. So where, let's say A, C got 150 here, and they got 75 and 75, then that would avoid C having the gain, now C would be exposed more so than A and B uh, pursuant to the indemnity. So it's like a trade-off between the tax and the book and the um, economic consequences. Um, one last thing uh, it would be, let's check the books. The books add up. We got 1,500 of book value on the left side. We've got 300 of debt and 1,200 of capital count. So that makes sense. We can look at our inside basis is 450 and our outside basis is 500. So here's where we have our inside base and outside basis don't balance. And that's not, we didn't do anything wrong. That's permissible. It's not perfect. It's not conceptually pure. It shouldn't really happen, but when, when we don't allow people to go negative basis, then it's going to happen in these contexts. And there's a way to sort of ameliorate the effect of that. But I just wanted to point that out. 
that uh, here the inside base and outside bases don't balance, but it's not a problem, at least a technical problem. It's not a, it doesn't mean we did something wrong, but our books balanced and that has to happen. Okay. Um, well, we're going to have more opportunity to go over this problem because we're going to change fact patterns tomorrow. We're going to make this non-recourse and we'll see how it changes. Um, but uh, that's all we have for today. Okay, so um, I'll see everybody on, on Wednesday. Uh, e email me with any questions. See you later. Bye-bye.